Okay, folks. So um, I had some questions come in on an Instagram post that I did uh, promoting a conversation with Karalia with AJ Hendry. Now, AJ Hendry is a youth worker. He works in the social justice realm. He works with homelessness. And so I was having a dialogue with him around that. And then someone dropped in a question here. And because the questions are quite nuanced, I just felt like answering in a comment on an Instagram post, not the best way. So I'm going to attempt <laughs> to answer here on this video. So the first statement that came in from the commenter was, I'm curious, to what extent do you believe <clears throat> high levels of spiritual attainment are or are not possible at all without high world travel enabling levels of money? All right. So basically, can you attain high levels of spiritual spiritual attainment without money? Right. And so I answered that saying, I don't think money's got anything to do with it. It's about desire to practice and ripeness to realize, right? Um, and so then the response was, well, it takes money, though, to travel to different places around the world to meet teachers, et cetera. The logical contrapositive equivalent statement to that is that if you don't have the money, then you cannot travel to meet a teacher. And then if a further consequence would then be that if spiritual development is contingent on needing such a teacher, it is thus hindered, because you don't have the money to travel to one, significantly. Alternatively, we, we may then reason that, well, maybe money truly isn't required and then spirituality does not need such a teacher, but then why would you seek them out? And also it feels arrogant and pride cometh before the fall to say one is absolved or above needing a teacher. You can see what I mean? There is so much in that comment okay so i'm going to attempt to answer first and foremost it's important to realize that there is absolute reality and relative reality and there is from a teaching perspective there is no one right answer per se there is only the answer arising from conditions okay so you can't, I, I can't answer this question and say that you need money to spiritually realize or you don't need money to spiritually realize because it's completely dependent upon circumstances and upon conditions. So if you look at some students, like when I said, I don't think money has anything to do with it. It's about desire to practice and ripeness to realize. What I'm pointing to is that when someone has this immense desire above all else to realize, to, to practice, to attain, then one will do anything and everything to receive teachings, to work with practices, whether or not they even encounter a teacher, right? Because it's not necessarily about encountering a teacher in real life. Sometimes the teachers come in dreams. Uh, sometimes the teachers come in our interactions with the world, like the guru, the guru is a tattva, it is a principle, it's an underlying principle of reality, and the guru tattva will, yeah, absolutely manifest in a person, but it can also manifest in so many other ways, so from this perspective, there is no answer to this question, right, some people may need money in order to realize, some people may not need money in order to realize um, on a very practical relative level we first usually have to meet our survival needs right if you don't have your survival needs met then you don't have the freed up energy in order to pursue spirituality as such and so you can say from that perspective that walking a spiritual path requires a certain level of privilege or you know certain conditions in one's life and there is also lots of exceptions to that where people just abandon everything abandon survival and literally just go and chase down the teacher in whichever way shape or form that ends up looking right and so if money truly isn't required then spirituality does not need such a teacher. I, I would say that's a false equivalency. That's It's not saying that if you don't need money to spiritually realize, then logically you don't need a teacher. That's not it at all. Um, again, it's a both and. 
sometimes we need a teacher and sometimes what can unfold through practice and we just have no idea what people have experienced in past lives assuming past lives are a thing can't know what people's karma is like what practice they might have done and like there's just again there's so many different conditions and there's it feels to me a little bit like these questions are I'm just going to say it. It feels a bit like intellectual masturbation. It's like, pff, what's going on for you and, and your life? Um, but at the same time, these questions are bringing up really important things around privilege, around money, around spirituality, and around, you know, for those of us that might be teaching the spiritual realms, et cetera, do we have an obligation? Do we have a responsibility to make the teachings accessible to people who might not have yet might not have the financial um, means, right, to go after them. So these are things that are worth exploring. But again, I say they're worth exploring from a direct experience. How does this impact me? What is my role in this particular dance? Whereas I don't think it's possible to necessarily explore it from a very abstract way, because again, it's all relative to conditions. It all depends upon conditions um it feels arrogant and pride cometh before the fall to say one is absolved of or above needing a teacher again see it depends how you interpret teacher if you're looking at it from the perspective that the guru is a tattva it is an underlying principle of reality and the guru tattva expresses in a multitude of forms not just a physical person but to know that and to have the understanding or, or have received the teachings to know how to interact with reality in that way, you have to receive those teachings, right? I wish I had some exact stories to share, but the, the way that reality unfolds, the great pattern of it all is when the desire is there and the karma is there, all the factors are there, then things will happen. They will happen. Um, okay, I'm going to go on to the second piece here. This person says, also, I find it surprising that you are doing this with a social justice lens, because if you admit marginalization, then that means to admit that some people are structurally blocked from accessing teachers, and that has implications and ramifications when it comes to spirituality. So what are they? Are they that if marginalized by society, we can dismiss for ourselves the need for a teacher of the same quality or claim for ourselves that we can get the same result as you have from traveling far without needing to travel far. But does that, and how does it run into questions of humility versus arrogance? All right, let's just take this one sentence at a time. I, I find it surprising you're doing this with the social justice lens. Okay, well, I am. Like, I'm all, all things, both. And, you know, like, I deal with the relative, I deal with the absolute, and from the perspective of awakening, it's like we perceive to a certain band and then our perception broadens 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 and then our perception broadens. And it means that all the things are happening in there. So social justice, of course, I'm aware of a social justice lens, but it's not the broadest lens that I'm looking through. There are broader lenses that I perceive and interact with but sometimes those lenses are inappropriate or maybe non-beneficial to be applying to certain situations. And they can be almost cruel to, to use, right? So the different lenses like that, right? If you admit marginalization, if I admit it, um, then that means to admit that some people are structurally blocked from accessing teachers, yeah, it can appear that it is more challenging for people to access a teacher, you could say. You know, like, how many teachers are on YouTube, though? You know, Ram Das, Maharaji, you know, all of the Krishna, Krishnamurti, all these teachers are available for free um, at public libraries um, on the internet. But, of course, that also assumes a certain level of privilege that you have access to the internet, that you have access to a public library, Um but I would say that there is always, mostly, I mean, you can probably come up with an example that proves the rule, a way to access teachers, 
right? Recognizing that from the broadest possible lens, the teacher in real life ceases to necessarily be such a thing because they're like, oh, to have a felt sense of engaging, interacting with the teacher on the subtle realms, it can be, you know, like some of the most extraordinary breakthroughs that I've had have come about when a teacher's showing up in a dream, right? And you could say that everybody dreams. So is there a, st a structural block to someone having a dream with a teacher? I don't know. But that also, right, that also doesn't mean that I'm saying don't worry about those structural blocks. They don't matter. There's still ways that we can meet and respond to them if we are teaching in those realms and make it more accessible for people to come. You see, it's a both and. It's not a this or a that. There is no such thing as a this or a that. It's all the things simultaneously at once. All right. So on one level, nobody is blocked from teachings or teachers ever. On another level, it may appear that some people experience greater physical blocks. Both of those things can be true simultaneously. Are they that if marginalized by society, we can dismiss for ourselves the need for a teacher of the same quality or claim that we can get the same result as you had from traveling far without having to travel far? Um, but does that, how does it run into questions of humility versus arrogance? So what we're looking at here is how someone is orientating to how they're conceptualizing their experience of reality, right? And you can both be working without a teacher and be totally open to receiving teachings from a teacher in real life, right? So it doesn't mean that if marginalized by society that you then dismiss the benefit, you know, the be the the benefits that can come from working with an actual teacher, right? Again, it's both and. There are no this and that. And I think that, you know, when I read this question, that's what really comes up for me, all these different questions, is that it's all true simultaneously. And then what comes up for me is what is needed? What is crossing my path? How am I, as the practitioner, orientating to teachings and teachers what may I, as the practitioner, be experiencing as barriers? Are those barriers actually true? Or am I believing them to be true? What is my relationship as a practitioner, right? So that's one thing. And then the second is that if one is a teacher or in some way involved with, you know, spirituality, then how do I, as a teacher ensure that what I'm offering is more accessible, that there are less barriers, that it is easier for people to show up. And in that, it's just being aware of other people's different structural experiences of reality, right? And that's where having a social justice lens is beneficial. But remembering that from a absolute lens is much, much broader, much, much wider. So all of these things can be concurrently happening. Um, you know, like I haven't actually, like have I, I'd say one of the teachers that's impacted me the most that's been freaking extraordinary is Shiva Ray. And I tune into her all the time. I've had limited contact with her in person. I went to LA in 2010, cost me probably about five, six, seven grand to go over there and complete my yoga teacher training with her. She came to New Zealand in 2016, cost me about a thousand dollars, I think, to do another, you know, immersion with her. But most of my really deep experiences with her have been dreams. Um, and also literally when I'm in practice and I just tune into her, I tune into what she brings through, what she brings forth. And I feel her with me. I feel her holding me. I feel her encouraging me just yeah and that's you could say that that happens because I had the in real life experiences with her that were generated from cash um and again I come back to desire and will it, it's like when someone goes I want to have that experience I'm going to find a way to make that happen even if they're marginalized or don't have any money like when the will is there it will happen because you orientate in that direction no matter fucking what, 
no matter fucking what. And that level of desire to realize when nothing else matters, where you are willing to do anything, where you are willing to burn up all the shit, that is the thing. And ain't got nothing to do with how much money someone has. And when you are having to deal with survival and you don't know where your food is coming from and you don't know where the shelter is coming from and all of those things, that is going to take up enormous bandwidth, which may mean that you're not having such a strong activation towards awakening or liberation because survival is a thing, right? Like I say, it's all concurrent. It's all concurrent. It is all happening within the absolute within the relative okay anything else that needs to be said on this yeah I just keep coming back to the direct experience rather than intellectualizing and talking about shit you can't talk about shit if there's specific conditions how does it relate to me what am I being called to do how do I need to respond um Again, if you feel really moved to decrease the barriers that some people might experience when accessing spiritual teachings, then do that. Be the one who supports in some way, shape, or form the lowering of barriers. Do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to stop talking now. I really appreciate the questions. Uh, hopefully, there's been some benefit in this video this is just my rantings my direct experience how I perceive it I don't know if this is an official teaching in any particular lineage or whatever take it if you wish leave it if you wish hmm.